So welcome everyone to Diversity Training That Changes People with Ralph Brandt of RDR Group. As we get started today, we're curious to find out some of your insights on this topic of diversity training. So I am going to launch a few polls and we welcome your participation. So the first poll is, have you ever attended a diversity training? And we would love to hear from you about that topic. The poll should be showing on your screen and we welcome you to participate. Um, it is a yes or no question. Um, and if you can see the poll, uh, I don't see anyone answering it yet. Um, oh, it's okay. I know why. Sorry about that. Um, it's not showing yet. Here we go. Um, so here we go. This poll is in process. Have you ever attended a diversity training? And we welcome your input. Thanks so much. And a shout out to Cindy at Swedish American Health System in Rockford, Illinois, who's watching with a group. Thank you so much for participating with us today. I'm gonna to give you a few more moments to answer this poll, and then we'll take a look at those results. Okay. Um, so it looks like of those of you attending today, about 80% of you have attended a, a diversity training and only about 20% have not. Um, so, um, I'm going to stop sharing those results and let's take a look at our next poll. Have you ever wondered if diversity training can change someone's biases? Again, a yes, no, and we welcome your input. If you're having trouble seeing the poll, what you want to do is make sure that your Zoom panel is maximized so that you can see the entire screen as Zoom. And it looks like uh, many of you are answering this poll, so thank you in advance for your engagement with this poll. And we will show those results uh, again soon. Looks like, I'm gonna give you just a few more seconds on this one. So it's possible that if you have logged into Zoom using a browser, you may not be able to see the poll. Um, if you can download the Zoom app, you'll have full functionality. Okay, so let's take a look at these results. It looks like 91% of you have wondered if diversity training can change someone's biases. What do you think about that, Ralph? Yeah, well, I would think if I was attending a training, I'd want to know if it's going to have any effect too. So um, this topic in particular. Here's our third poll for today. Do you feel you have strong relationships with people of other races, religions, sexual orientations, and age groups? We'll just give this one a few more seconds as well. You all are pretty fast on answering, so I appreciate that. We wanna give everyone a chance to share their thoughts. Okay, this is surprising to me. Um, we have about 85% of the people on the call who feel that they absolutely have strong relationships with people who are different from them. So thank awesome. you for that. Uh, a couple more polls for all of you. Um, do you feel that some of your biases may have changed over the years? How many of you would say not that much? And how many would say no noticeably your biases may have changed? Uh, Ralph and I spoke a little bit earlier as, as we were preparing for the call and we were talking about this very question. So thanks to you who are answering this poll very quickly. And I'll just give it a few more seconds so we can get everyone's input. Okay, last call on this one. So 78% of you uh, noticeably feel that your biases have changed over the years. So thanks for sharing and one Final question here. What percentage of your coworkers would you feel, would you guess, feel totally included, accepted, and valued in the workplace? This is a really interesting one. Right. It is indeed. And I think, you know, another follow-up question, and if folks want to answer this in the chat, I'm curious how many of you who are on the call feel totally included, accepted, and valued in the workplace. All 
All right, so we're going to close this one up soon. This question is the hardest to answer, Allison says. Um, I'm curious as to why, if you want to share, and uh, I would also welcome your answer in the chat to the question of, do you personally feel totally included, accepted, and valued in the workplace? Uh, okay, so I'm going to end this one and show the results. Um, it looks like the greatest majority, majority of you, um, let's see, so. Less than half. Right? think that less than half of people feel valued in the workplace. Sorry, I was having a hard time uh, trying to explain those results. <laughs> yeah, but only 17% would have said 75 to 100%, which is remarkable. How does this stack up to what you've seen in other situations, Ralph? It, very common. I mean, and, you know, it's not unusual for a lot of participants to say less than half are really fully engaged. Um, did you get any uh, comments in the chat or? Is yeah, I do, I have some. So um, one person says, not always. I see I do, though I work as a consultant for an amazing foundation. Unfortunately, not in all situations. I have an I do. 90% uh, of the time I feel included, still some inclusion based on gender. Um, I work remote, so I feel like I'm easily forgotten or left out. Hmm. Um, and uh, Lindsay says she thinks that these could be three separate questions. So maybe you might feel totally included, maybe not totally accepted, maybe not totally valued. So yeah. that could be three separate questions. All right, well, let's dive into today's conversation, Ralph. I'm so excited to talk with you. I want, uh, for those of you who maybe have never been exposed to Ralph Brandt or RGR Group, I do want to take a moment to introduce Ralph. I met Ralph earlier this year and my team and I have thoroughly enjoyed working with Ralph and Rich and the rest of the RDR group team. Uh, so for those who might not know Ralph, RDR group has been around for about 20 years. Ralph has been working in RDR group a little bit less time than that. Um, and we may have a chance to talk more about the history of the company and your experience later on. But RDR group uh, provides a lot of different training around the country to amazing organizations, including some universities and healthcare systems and other corporate entities. And uh, Ralph, um, I'm especially interested in today's topic. I know that it's going to be very engaging, that we have a whole lot to learn together. Um, so I know you've been doing this for a really long time, and I'm curious what you've seen change um, and what you're doing that's different related to diversity training, Ralph. Yeah, that's a good question, Becky. Well, you know, I've actually been in this particular field for almost 25 years, and I think we've seen changes in language. So way back when it used to be affirmative action and EEO, and then it kind of became diversity or sensitivity training, and then it moved to terms like inclusion. Um, so there have been language changes, even um, you know, you'll, you'll go through phases where people want to talk about unconscious bias or micro inequities and that kind of thing. And I also think the focus has changed a little bit. You know, in the early days, it was really uh, largely about gender and race and maybe age. But I think diversity now, it, it has to do with just about anything. But, but one thing that hasn't changed in my experience, and it's, it's really one of the questions we asked in the survey was kind of grounded in this um, perception, is whether or not training can change people, you know? So companies spend a lot of money to do diversity training. They send a lot of people through. Does it really do any good? Um, can you change people's biases? Can you prove it? Um, and so when you ask what we're doing that's different, I think what we're trying to do is focus on inclusive practices. Because when you, when you look at behavior, what people can do and get people to actually do it after the training, it won't happen in a class, right? Um, you could go to a class on nutrition and learn everything you need to know about eating healthy. But if you don't do it, it's a complete waste of time, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that's how people feel about diversity training. And so we're putting more emphasis now on what we call proven practices. Because we want people to go out and do these things because um, that's something that can be measured. And in my opinion, that's something that can really produce change. You know, 
Mm. Yeah, that's helpful. So um, what I hear you saying is that there are some serious doubts out there in the market about whether training can change people. Yeah, for sure. And I tell them most training probably doesn't change people. Um, it, I, I think of like it, fitness programs. If you look at any fitness program, any diet, if you actually did what they prescribe, you would lose weight and you would get fit. So the question isn't whether you know, the training could change people, it can, but it only changes people if they do it. And so what we're trying to do now is kind of move this discussion of diversity training to diversity practices. You know, what is it we need to do to actually make a change and, and then how can we prove it, you know? Sure, so talk to me a little bit more about how you, how you do this, what your ideas are. Well, what we try to do is focus on behaviors, right? So what are the things that people need to do to be more inclusive? We use the term connecting, right? Because everybody wants to connect better with their team. They want to connect better with their boss, even with their own family members, even as a society. So what do we need to do to connect as human beings with all people, not just people like us? Um, and if you focus on those behaviors, and then task people to do those things after the training and really help them do the practices, um, we feel that's when things are really gonna change. And of course, there are some people that don't wanna connect with everybody, we know that, right? Um, there may be people in your, your own world or environment, not you specifically, Becky, but anybody listening to the webinar, but we don't really wanna connect with them but it's our opinion if you want to succeed at work, if you want to succeed in life, the more people you can connect with, the more successful you're going to be. And what we want to do is prove it. We want to do something to actually prove scientifically that you can change people's biases. Well, I know that later on we're going to talk a little bit about a study that you're doing that is attempting um, to, to evaluate whether this can be proved through science. Um, but for now, can you give us an example of how these inclusive practices that you're talking about, how they actually work? Sure. Um, so what we do is focus on what we consider to be the main um, behaviors. There's probably hundreds of things we could do to be more inclusive, but we look at what we think of as five large, largely unconscious behaviors. Most of them are things we don't even know we're doing that create disconnects with people that are different and maybe with a lot of people. And then with each of the unconscious behaviors that may not be working for us, we also introduce some inclusive practices that kind of correspond where people can be more inclusive. So I'll give you one example. Um, mm -hmm. One thing that all of us do is something called flocking. So anthropologists say that we like to kind of find our group for protection, for safety, for identity, whatever. And um, those people usually have things in common with us. And um, we think that it's natural to do it, but it's not strategic to do it. And it's certainly not inclusive because what happens is we kind of divide out into little camps. And um, you'll often see people flock by age group, ethnicity, interests, um, job function is a big one in the workplace. We certainly have religious flocks, um, gender flocks, you know, just about anything imaginable. And it creates something that uh, sociologists call inbreeding. We all know what that term is, right? And it's extremely unhealthy for individuals and for organizations. In fact, I wanted to uh, prove it to you by doing a little activity if I could. Is that all right with you, Becky? Oh, yes, let's do it. So um, I know a lot of you uh, who are watching may have seen this activity. And if you have, you know, maybe you could just kind of uh, watch instead of participate. But I'm going to put a slide on the screen in about five seconds. And all I want each of you to do is look at the screen and count the number of Fs as in flock, right? Um, that you see on the screen. And I'll give you about 30 seconds. So just look at the screen and count the number of Fs as in flock. Okay, I'll give you 30 seconds. And once you've had a chance to do that, Ralph, aren't we going to ask people to put the number into the chat? Yes, yes, I will. 
You got about right. 12 seconds to go. All right. We did this uh, before we got on the call uh, to practice and it was, it was really interesting. Okay, why don't you tell us how many you counted? Just put it in the chat so Becky can read out loud what you counted um, on that last screen. How many Fs did you count? Yeah, I'm seeing a few different numbers come up. I saw three, I saw four, five, eight, six, nine, seven, uh, oh, 71. Count. I think that must have been a typo. Four, four, six. Okay. Um, yeah, Justin, you're keeping me awake there. Um, so a, a whole bunch of different numbers here. Uh, okay. Four, five, seven. All kinds of different answers, which is what we get when we do this activity. And it's really crazy because we were all looking at the same screen and all doing the same thing, just looking on the screen, counting the number of Fs. Now, when we do it live, we actually ask people to get into groups. And the largest group is always the fours. So if you counted four, you're in the majority. Um, that's usually what people count and that's a big group in a classroom and it makes you think you're right because you're surrounded by a lot of other people who think like you do or see things like you do but I'm going to show you the slide again and if it, when I go to the next screen the ofs will be highlighted trust me it's the same exact slide there's actually eight uh, you can count them if you're looking at the slide right now uh, there's eight f's this is the last screen this is the same screen, there's eight. And a lot of people are like, oh my gosh, how did I miss that? How did I only get two or three? Or how did I see five? Most people see four. In fact, what's interesting is when people see all eight, they're sometimes in the minority and they actually think they must've done it wrong because everybody else is standing with the fours, right? Mm -hmm. To me, this is, a, this is a great example of the flocking phenomenon. When we surround ourselves with people who see what we see, we don't see the missing Fs. And we're finding out that people more and more are uh, defriending people on Facebook that don't agree with them. There's more, no more dialogue. We're getting more entrenched in our flocking. And it limits us because we don't see the whole picture. Getting input from women, from people of color, from people of different religions or different functions in an organization is extremely healthy. So the counter behavior that we talk about in the class, instead of always going to lunch with the same people, always going to the same people for input, is something we call networking. Now networking is something all of us are familiar with, but we put a diversity spin on that uh, particular word, as we're expecting people to network with people who are different than them to be very deliberate and intentional, to make sure that you know, your interactions are not just with people like you. So this is an inclusive practice, if this makes sense, Becky, as opposed to just sitting in a classroom and learning about networking, the inclusive practice that we associate with this is when they leave the classroom, we want them to find someone who's different than them and begin interacting with them. In fact, we ask them to make a commitment of eight weeks once a week, having interactions with someone who's different than them in a significant way, maybe someone of a different race, maybe a different age group, maybe somebody of a different function in the organization, but by making a practice and habit of this over eight weeks, that's what's gonna change people, not sitting in a classroom, if that makes sense. No, that makes a lot of sense, and I think I want to repeat it. Um, so what I hear you saying, Ralph, is that um, it's not hearing in the classroom that it's important to network with people who are different from you. It's actually implementing it outside the classroom, which is what will begin to change people. Yes, absolutely. And so we've kind of, um, we've shifted our entire um, training organization to not just do a classroom experience, but now what we're focused on is providing all the support tools, discussion templates. We're actually uh, staying in touch with people to encourage them when they participate in the class to make sure each week they're getting together with people who are different than them because it's the practice that's going to make the change happen. Sure. And, you know, um, one of the things that's going on in my head, Ralph, is, you know, I happen to live in a place where there isn't a ton of diversity. But mm -hmm. what I hear you saying is uh, 
and we've had this conversation before, you know, even if you think people look the same on the outside, you want to seek out diversity of opinion or like you said, diversity of age or um, diversity of perspective and be sure you're exposing yourself to people who can bring a different point of view. Absolutely. In fact, sometimes I tell people you could be a woman and work for a woman and not connect with them. You know, all women mm -hmm. don't get along if you haven't heard that, Becky. Um, um, I have mostly women in my organization. Okay. I think I have noticed so, that. <laughs> right. So, so what we ask people to do is think about which differences are making a difference. You know, it might be age. It could be you're the only single person. Everybody else is married. But there are things that make people feel left out. And it's not just race. It's not just sexual orientation. It's not just gender. You know, mm -hmm. white males cannot connect too. So the idea is, you know, flock with someone who's different in some way um, intentionally with the tools that we provide so that you're actually doing these things instead of just learning about them. Yeah. That's super powerful. And we have some comments in the chat um, kind of reinforcing the idea um, that it's so important to seek relationships with others who are different from you, mm -hmm. not just knowing people who are different from you, and that this is um, an experience and not just one and done. And thanks to Olivia, she has a comment here that she loves the question, what makes you feel left out? And I, I think going back to the poll that we had earlier, Ralph, it seems like it would be really powerful to ask people um, those, those three questions from the final poll. Do you feel accepted here? Do you feel included here? Uh, do you feel valued here? As a means of getting at what that factor might be that's making someone feel left out or um, influencing yeah. them. And to Olivia's point, um, I don't know if this would make sense, but we tell people your differences can change in terms of how you're experiencing them. So you could be in one setting where you feel a socioeconomic difference because everybody you're with has a lot of resources and you may not. You could be in another setting where it's your education that is the difference. And so what makes you feel excluded depends on who you're with. And, you know, the dynamic in that particular room. So, you know, you could be African American and not feel like that's really the issue, but it, but it could be that you're the, the new person or you're from a different area of the country. And so as, as complicated as it, as it sound, sounds, different differences play out differently in different settings, if you could follow all that. Sure. Okay. Uh, that, <laughs> yes, definitely. So we have a comment here from Gina who says she thinks it's important to understand the systems of oppression and marginalization that are in play. Any thoughts on that, Ralph? Sure. So, you know, the behaviors are just a starting point. Uh, the truth is a lot of these behaviors actually have been systematized. Um, and so uh, I think of the flocking example you know, some organizations only recruit at certain schools and they don't realize that that's a flocking phenomenon. They're gravitating toward, you know, a one particular source instead of networking across the board. So, yeah, this is not just a one on one problem. It is a systemic problem. Absolutely. Well, let's talk a little bit more about how you stay in touch with participants. So, you know, someone experiences a diversity training with RDR. Um, what is that, that follow up? Um, that's so different? What does that look like? Well, I, I don't think we realized what we were taking on when we moved to the inclusive practices because we agreed that we would stay in touch with all the participants. And right now we're, we're actually, we've got six different groups, what we call cohorts. So they've gone through the session, they've agreed to do the follow-up practices, and we're actually sending them emails each week to encourage them to meet with what we call their connecting partner. And to follow the, the, the guidelines, the templates that we send them each week. And then they write back and tell us how it's going and or that they are on vacation and have to miss a week. But you know, we're pretty gracious. Everybody graduates as, as long as they're trying. But the goal is to get them to try to have eight meetings in eight weeks. Um, and we stay in touch with them. And you know, some people are radio silent. You know, we don't really hear from them until we do the graduation. So after eight weeks, we have a little webinar reunion and we find out how it went for everybody. But I'm telling you, um, it has been incredibly effective because we're, we're making sure that these people are doing it. And in order to make that happen, you kind of have to track them and encourage them a lot. Sure. So how can you prove, uh, you know, we talked at the beginning of the hour that 
most of the people on this call are uh, skeptical or wondering how diversity training can make a difference. So how can you prove that? Um, because I know currently there's a trend to talk about this unconscious bias. And so how can you change that bias and prove that you have? Yeah, well, this has been one of the most exciting parts of what we do. Um, it just so happened that one of our clients, uh, we have a lot of universities, as you mentioned, in our client base, and we have a lot of healthcare clients and corporate clients. But um, it just so happened that we were able to get some people in a prominent university, and I have to be careful about talking about this because the study is still going on, um, to really look at how interacting with people who are different than us affects our brain chemistry so that you can actually measure this. So they've already done some studies that uh, tell us that when we interact with people that we perceive as other, in other words, we perceive them as a threat of some kind, it actually creates um, cortisol, which is the stress hormone, the fight or flight chemical. And I have a slide to kind of picture that. So you know, if you see someone who's Muslim as a threat, your cortisol levels will raise just when you interact with people in that group. Now the operative word, Kelly, or Becky, is, um, is if you perceive them that way, right? So you and I have spoken before, if, you, if people see someone with a tattoo and brow ring and think that, oh, what's, what's up with that? Um, and they see it as other, they'll have a, a slight raise in their cortisol or stress hormones. But if you have a kid that's got tattoos or you have a tattoo, it's something familiar, it's not a threat. And, and so there's already been some work suggesting that you can test someone's cortisol or stress levels when they interact with people that are different to determine how much of a, a difference are they perceiving and what's it doing to their brain chemistry, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. And I always tell people, cortisol makes us tense it makes us stressed. So the relationships with people that you perceive as different tend to be stressed. And it also makes us irrational and it exaggerates our perceptions. So you can see how unhealthy this is, right? Mm -hmm. but, but here's what's really cool, okay? Um, and we had nothing to do with this. This happened before our DR group got on the scene. There've also been some other studies that suggest if you know one person you have some familiarity or comfortability with one person in a group that you previously perceived as other or different. Your cortisol levels go down with all people in that group. Mm. And I just think that's amazing. That's how our brains are wired up, by getting familiar and comfortable. So, you know, if I can show you the next slide, it's really by changing our perceptions that we become comfortable with everyone in a particular group. Now, that doesn't mean people who are difficult and have difficult personalities. But if you have exposure to young people, if you ex have exposure to people of different religions, different mindsets, different genders, different even political views, and you can get comfortable with that, it allows us to interact more effectively, if that makes sense. No, that's amazing. So uh, tell me a little bit more, Rich, about why this is so important. Yeah, and you just called me Rich and- you, Oh, you know, I just called you your brother's name? Oh my goodness. Why, right? uh, so for those of you who don't know Ralph and Rich, they're twin brothers. They're really easy to tell apart. We're gonna have Rich on an upcoming webinar event this fall. And uh, yeah, I don't know why I called you Rich. Sorry, Ralph. <laughs> no, that's okay. So we look alike. People know, but they just don't always use the right term, so. Well, your name is right there on the screen. <laughs> yeah, right? I'm feeling excluded right now, I'm kidding. Okay. <laughs> So, so here's why it makes a difference to people, especially business people, but I believe this is true in families and certainly in our society right now. When we create comfortability by interacting with people that are different than us, it changes our brain chemistry and healthy chemicals get released. And I'm gonna show you a picture of two different brains, okay? We often do this in the classroom and I'll ask people, what do you notice about the, the brain on the right? And people go, oh, it's all lit up. And I go, yeah, it's all lit up. Tell me why you think it's all lit up. And they always say drugs. They say, is it drugs? <laughs> and I tell them it is. It's, it's actually natural drugs. The brain on the right is lit up because neurochemicals like oxytocin, serotonin, healthy chemicals are being produced in a brain when it's feeling 
a sense of well-being, when it's comfortable. And so when we interact with people and have comfortability, that's what our brain looks like. When we're interacting with people that we have not become comfortable with, we're experiencing cortisol, which is that brain on the left, and it limits us. Because when we're under threat, you know, all of our functions narrow, and it's not good for business, it's, it's not good for relationships. So for us, what we're trying to do is light up people's brains by helping them to become more inclusive with all people, and they then become successful with all customers, with all coworkers. Um, and it's, you know, it's not a pure science, but we can actually measure it scientifically now, and, and that's what we want to do. So um, Allison is asking for some follow-up here and wondering if you can give any kind of reference or source for your statement that even one positive experience with someone from a threatening group can positively influence interactions with the entire group. Yeah. So um, is it Allison? Allison. Mm -hmm. yep. um, I'm going to ask Allison if she can just connect with me on an email because um, the research is really technical and I'm working with people who are neuroscientists and it's way above my pay grade, but there are some journal articles um, and, and I can tell you they're really deep journal articles with these experiments, but I'd be glad to share it with Allison and anybody else who's interested. Perfect. And Allison says, of course, and thank you. you um, so let's talk a little bit more about this study. I know that the study is designed to see if diversity training can change people. Um, so we want to hear more. And I, I know we're going to be careful about the details. Yes. So, so it's, it's ongoing. We're about halfway done. Um, and I'm going to move to the next slide to kind of help people understand how do you prove this, that people can really change. So what we're going to do is take 100 leaders that work for this healthcare system that I told you about, and they're gonna interact with people of a different race. Now, we could have done this with regard to age or gender, and we, we just had to isolate one particular difference, so we're doing it with race. They're gonna interact with people of a different race, same gender, and we're gonna measure, not us, but the people at the university are gonna measure the stress levels, the, the cortisol levels, right? Um, and what we anticipate is in the initial interactions, there may be some raised stress, particularly for those who aren't comfortable yet, and um, it's gonna provide a baseline. Then we're gonna take half of those people, 50 of them, through the, the training that we do on diversity, coupled with an eight-week commitment to do the inclusive practices that are associated with the training. And then we're going to retest all of them as they interact one more time with people of a different race. And what we anticipate is that cortisol levels and stress levels will be lower for those who've spent two months actually interacting and creating familiarity with people who are different. And for us, this is really awesome because it'll be the first time that we know of that uh, we've actually proved that diversity training can change people if they do it, right? Hmm. Wow, that's really powerful. So Claudia has a follow up question here. Um, you had referenced Ralph that when people perceive a threat, their cortisol levels are raised. Um, mm -hmm. And she is wondering what if you just perceive someone as other? Do you have any insights about what happens to cortisol levels in that situation? Yeah, it's interesting. We don't really have to see them as a serious threat. Um, it could be something as subtle as a person has an accent and we're not familiar with it, we're not comfortable with it. It actually registers slightly different in our brain um, because it's something unfamiliar. So mm -hmm. I don't know if that's the nature of the question, but it doesn't have to be a threat. It just has to be, as you said in the question, other. Sure, okay, that makes sense. I wanna make sure that um, Ralph, <laughs> that we've covered everything about the study before we, uh, I don't know if you have another slide about the study. Yeah, you know, I don't think I do. Let me see what the next slide is. Nope, the next slide's another um, opportunity to do some learning if we have time for it. Oh, I think that we do. I was just taking a look at the, um, at the clock. So um, let's talk a little bit about any clients that you have who are using the follow-up practices because that's such a powerful difference with the way this diversity training is working and some of the other topics too. 
Yeah, so it's amazing. We have a lot of clients that are now interested in doing this, and that's great because, you know, there's no question, even without the science, doing these things after the training, it really uh, protects the investment that companies are making to help their organizations be more inclusive. And so we have about a half a dozen clients that are using it now, but there's only one place where we're actually doing the biometric testing, and that's with this project that we've shared. So, um, and we're getting amazing feedback from people who are really learning for the first time what it means to be inclusive and, and what it means to be different. And um, I think that people are making friends and they're also working better together. That is so powerful. Um, so can you give us any other advice today on this call um, about how to be more inclusive? Yeah, so we mentioned one thing, stop flocking and try to network more. But we also talk in, in our training about what we call cultural naivete. And that's just doing things that we don't even know we're doing. It might offend people that are different than us simply because we don't think like they do. And the counter behavior in that case is sensitivity. So we raise our awareness of how we impact other people. And if we learn how to read nonverbal cues, people getting quiet when we show up or, you know, people who, you know, seem like they uh, don't respond to our emails. Those are sometimes nonverbal cues that people are comfortable with us. And um, what we're trying to do with the inclusive practices so that we're not naive and really ignorant in the true sense of the word is get people to ask questions to create understanding and empathy because again it changes our brain chemistry because we tend to be afraid of things that we don't know so if we begin networking the next step is to actually create understanding in those interactions so built into those eight weeks of interactions it doesn't even require any extra time and people love that um, are some questions that allow them to start understanding more about one another. Um, another thing we talk about is something called monoculturalism, which is a big long word, but it's a real simp simple concept. It's, it's just having a one size fits all approach to every client, to every interaction. We all have a style or a way of even managing people. And instead of being monocultural and expecting everybody to be like us, we teach people how to calibrate and adjust for differences. And so the inclusive practices include some really cool assessment tools to kind of discover how you're wired up and how you're conditioned culturally and how to be more flexible in your interactions. And then um, because we're running out of time, I'm gonna to go to the last one, which we call unconscious filtering. And I wanna show you what unconscious filtering looks like, okay? Um, and here's how I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna show you the next slide and I'd like the people on the call to just memorize the three sayings that will be on this slide. It'll only take you about 15 seconds. So when I, when I change the screen, look at the screen, memorize these three sayings, and we'll see if you can get them right, okay? You've got about 15 seconds, here we go. All right. Five more seconds. Okay, I'm gonna blank the screen here. So I'm wondering how many of you saw Paris in the spring, bird in the hand, once in a lifetime? Go ahead and tell us in the chat if that's what you saw. Paris in the spring, bird in the hand, once in a lifetime, yeah? That's what everyone is saying yes to. One person said no. So uh -huh. for, for the person who said no, we'd love to hear what you saw instead. Aha, okay. some people got the trick. Okay, some people see it, some people don't. Mm -hmm. Let me show you the screen again. It actually says Paris in the, the spring, bird in the, the hand, once in a, a lifetime. I'm glad some people saw it. Some people did. Trick slide. Um, mm -hmm. But here's what we're, what we're doing. We're showing people what unconscious filtering looks like. People tend to see what they expect to see because these are familiar sayings. There's even slides where words are missing and people fill them in. Our unconscious is that powerful. What we try to help people appreciate is we do this with people too, right? So we tend to make assumptions about people that are different than us. It impacts our interactions, especially if those assumptions are negative and then the outcomes are negative. 
and it just reinforces our assumptions. We actually think we're right when that person that we thought had an accent um, doesn't really get it. We treat them like they don't get it. Then they have difficulty getting it. And we just think, ah, I was right about them all along. What we try to introduce people to as a counter behavior this time is something called positive expectancy. What if all people made positive assumptions about other people? Not that everybody can be trusted or that everybody's gonna be their best, but that everybody could if they wanted to. Mm -hmm. And we need to act consistently in our interactions with customers, coworkers, family members, society, to believe the best in one another so we get better outcomes. And we actually have an inclusive practice that follows that particular behavior as well. This is how we really believe you not only change biases, but you change organizational cultures, you change human beings by the things that we do to be more inclusive, not the things that we say. Hmm. So <laughs> Olivia was asking that you, or actually it's someone else, Jean is asking that you repeat the phrase, it's positive expectancy, correct? Yes, positive expectancy. So that's just a, a psychological principle that when we believe the best in others and act on it, we're more likely to get positive outcomes. And there's all kinds of examples. If you wanna look up Jaime Escalante or watch a movie called Stand and Deliver, he's a teacher who really practiced positive expectancy and got phenomenal results with his students. And I think we can all do this in our workplace and in our families. Thanks for that. Um, there's some positive comments of you know people agreeing with you. Um, and wanting to be able to look at the good in all people. Um, so I know we've been talking a lot today, Ralph, about this topic of diversity and diversity training, and that's a key area for RDR Group. But can you talk to us about the other topics that RDR Group delivers training about? Sure. So, you know, by far the, the training we do the most is this connecting with others, which is our diversity and inclusion training. But we do training on customer service, we do training on developing trust. We do one on promoting respect in the workplace. And what we're trying to do is convert all of our training to uh, practices. So what do you have to do to build trust? What do you have to do to improve customer service? And uh, there's even been some preliminary studies around brain science to suggest that, you know, again, you can change people in a training if they practice these things after the training and that's what we're interested in we want to kind of move away from just sitting in a classroom and learning to getting people to actually do what they're learning and to help them encourage them follow up with them to make sure that the changes really stay that's uh, amazing um, and we're going to shift in just a moment to taking some q and a from our attendees um, and so if you have any questions for ralph about the the study at this university or about any of the concepts that he's been addressing so far, I would invite you to put those in the chat um, and we'll move to Q&A very soon. Uh, but before we do, uh, Ralph, we referenced that you've worked with a number of different types of clients over the years and I wondered if you could name a few. And then um, for those of you who might have questions, we would invite you to put those in the chat with, um, you know, to all panelists and attendees so everyone can see them. Yeah, so we've worked in just about every industry around the globe. Um, we've worked with General Motors and Ford. We've worked with Southwest Airlines. We've worked with Kroger Foods, Cisco Systems, um, probably a dozen universities. I'm going to guess 50 or 60 different healthcare systems. We work with the Department of Energy, Department of Interior. We've had a very rich, long career. Um, and the cool thing is these concepts work around the globe with every industry. You know, we all need to be more inclusive. We all need to build trust. We all need to serve a better. And that's really what we're about, you know, kind of helping to move the needle. Because even though it, this is not about science for us, this is about making the world better, you know, making outcomes for folks better. That's what really motivates us. Thanks, Ralph. So I have two folks actually asking for you to restate the five unconscious biases. Um, and uh, how convenient. Yeah. I think it's the next slide. Um, Perfect. Yeah. Um, so these are the five that we talk about 
Um, the one I didn't get a chance to mention is what we call pejorative behavior, number four, because there are people that do this on purpose. Pejorative just implies that it's mean-spirited behavior. It's not done by accident or unconsciously. There are people who don't want to include. And we talk about advocacy as the counter behavior. How can we take a stand for people, even people that are different than us, because nobody should be disparaged. Nobody should be excluded. Um, but these are the five. So on the left side, you'll see the, the behaviors that we think are unconscious that sometimes create disconnects. And then the right, are the corresponding competencies. So Ralph, would you take a moment to talk a little bit more about the monoculturalism versus calibration? Um, because I think that's one that you might have cut short also looking at time and I, I would love to hear more about it. Yeah, well, okay, now this is gonna be interesting. We don't have to do a poll on this, but there's probably a percentage of people on this call that are left-handed including me. Including me. Oh, Becky, I didn't know that. That's really cool. So did, most people don't know what percentage of the world is left-handed, but it's less than 10%. And I use that as an example of monoculturalism because Becky and I know something and all the left-handers on the call know something that the rest of the world probably doesn't know, that we spend most of our life adapting for a right-handed world. And I often think about this when it comes to diversity and inclusion. If you're different than the people you work with, then you have to do a lot of adapting and it creates a disadvantage for those people. So I wanted to be an architect of all things. If you, I don't know if you knew that, Becky, but- I didn't. Yeah, you probably didn't. And um, all the drawing tables when I was a kid were for right-handed children. And so I used to smudge my drawings. I had a very difficult time and I'm not blaming the tables, at not being a successful architect, but it made it harder. And I think sometimes we don't appreciate that women and people of color, people of religions that maybe are not in the dominant group or people of sexual orientations that are not in the dominant group are sometimes having to, to deal with the, that monoculturalism that kind of makes it more challenging for them in certain environments. And what we wanna teach people and organizations is calibration. How can we adjust for different age groups, different culture groups, so they don't have to become like the dominant group in order to succeed? Um, and again, there's a whole set of inclusive practices associated with this, but it's just learning how to be more flexible. Anybody who's partnered up on this call that has a spouse or a significant other, they know what it's like to have to adapt all the time. And if the more you're willing to do that, the more successful the interactions are gonna be. Well, you know, when you talk about that, Ralph, the thing that comes to my mind is um, in our workplace, one of the things that we've had to calibrate for is introversion versus extroversion. Yeah. Because in, in an organization where you have a lot of extroverts, you know, sometimes those introverts who might take longer to think about things or longer to respond, it, it may be more difficult for them to feel included and heard. Um, so that's what that no, excellent example. So remember when I told you some of these inclusive practices, we send them some assessment tools. One of them has to do with their personality types, their preferences, because yeah, we're all wired up differently and, and that's the essence of this particular behavior. Sure, so I have a question here from Tanya and she's wondering if there's any research into how long or how soon organizations can expect to see a change in culture after offering diversity and inclusion training. Well, I, th I think that the, the bad news is that most diversity training doesn't involve any practices after the training. And so as a result, people go through it and the book sits on a shelf and maybe there's slight changes, but they're really not significant. And so I'm afraid to say that in a lot of cases, companies are spending tons of money to do the training, but nobody's practicing it. And, um, but I would say if you have training, and people are actually expected to do something afterwards and you're tracking them for a period of time. We chose eight weeks. Now, I don't think you can change the world in eight weeks, but if you're meeting with one person every single week, and we ask people to make a commitment of at least 20 or 30 minutes a week, and a lot of folks are spending longer than that, I think that's enough to begin the process. But we tell folks that go through this, we don't want you to just do this once make this a, a habit for the rest of your life. Find someone new to connect with and don't just spend eight weeks, spend as much time as you can 
interacting. So I don't think this ship turns around quickly, mm -hmm. but I think it can, it can turn around. It, this, the, the, the movement in the right direction can happen within a period of, of months. And I think, you know, if, if you can get a uh, critical mass, then you begin to change organizations and cultures. Thanks, Ralph. Um, so um, I'm wondering if you have any suggestions, this comes from Cynthia, on uh, for executives about how they can be advocates for diversity and inclusion. Yeah, well, th this is the same problem. Every executive, every organization has something on their website where they're saying the right words. We are all about diversity. We believe in inclusion. Um, I think executives have to go from saying it to what I call getting it and then acting on it. Because I think there's a lot of executives that we think they're saying it, but they don't get it. And even if they get it, they have to take the time to practice it, right? So to me, it's about modeling inclusion. If you're at an executive level, you can't just talk about it and put it on websites. In fact, sometimes it's counterproductive because people watch what they do and it's the exact opposite of what they're saying and it creates a lot of dissonance. Yeah, that's very insightful, Ralph. Um, so Amy's wondering if there's a way to keep the process of change ongoing. Yeah, sure. You know, when we do these trainings and give people these templates, those templates are theirs to keep, you know, so they can use them over and over and over again with new people. And that's why I said for the experiment or the project that we're doing with the university, it's eight weeks, but we're telling clients, look, you know, try them for eight weeks with one particular individual. We call it a connecting partner. So think of someone you know that you'd like to connect better with who's different than you and use these practices for eight weeks. But the way to keep it ongoing is to just make sure that the organization um, makes it a practice. So after you're done with this individual for eight weeks, find someone else. And I think it could be a lifelong practice. I know it is for me. That's helpful. Um, wow, there's so many great questions. Um, just a quick note, my friend Gary, who's on the call, wants to know um, why you haven't done any training with elementary education, you know. Um, yeah, we have. We have done oh, some, yeah, nice. done some schools. Great. Um, so Cynthia, as a follow-up, is wondering what percentage of executives typically are part of the training that you're doing? Yeah, that just depends on the client. You know, so some of the organizations we work with, they start at the top because they know that's going to you know, create the most traction. Other organizations say, yeah, the executives don't have time or you know, they want a condensed version, um, which sends a message to me, to the whole organization, that you know, it's important for everybody else, but you know, the executives don't have to go through it. I think the, the organizations that really are serious about this, it starts at the top and everybody gets involved, but it, it doesn't always happen that way. And it's certainly not because that's how we would ha have it. It's just, that's what the clients want. Sure. So Christine is wondering if you've worked with any law enforcement agencies. Yeah, we have. We've worked with municipalities um, in Arizona and in Texas, um, in Missouri. Um, yeah, they, and they really need this. And, and uh, so it fits in very well with what they do because it's all about trying to control the cortisol levels so they can do their jobs and build trust in the community. That's really helpful. Um, so we did have a recommendation to someone on the topic of introversion to take a look at Susan Cain's book as a wonderful resource. And I'll give a shout to my author friend, Jennifer Conweiler, who's also written a couple of amazing books related to introverts in the workplace. Um, but Jody is wondering, for introverts, what suggestions do you have to help with networking? Yeah, so uh, there's no question. Some people find this a lot easier than others. And, but, but you're in control of the process when, when you do the inclusive practices, you get to pick a connecting partner and um, you get to decide which questions you're comfortable with and where you wanna meet. And people are doing it in lots of different ways that reflect their personalities. But I think when introverts begin to uh, put energy into um, including, they get better at it just like anything else. And so, you know, a lot of folks after they did the eight weeks said that they were introverts and having these one-on-one -on -one meetings was so useful to them because it also created some understanding 
from the people they were interacting with around their personalities and they were able to do the calibrating and adjusting so you know this is for all people not just folks that want to connect it's like something we have to do Oh, Rich. Rich put in a question for you, Ralph. I'll have to say it because it's funny. He wants to know if twins are different and if they can learn to get along. <laughs> ah, yeah. Well, I, I kind of feel like I should bring Rich on camera. Right? Yeah, just mm -hmm. so they can see. But, you know, it, people have asked us, what are two white males doing diversity training for, especially when they're identical twins? But I think there's a couple reasons. Oh, there's Rich. Yeah, look, you didn't even dress up for the webinar. I can't believe it. Yeah. That's you can unmute about. if you want to talk to us, Rich. Oh, there if you, you can go. figure Hello, out everybody. how. I, I'm actually the older brother by 10 minutes, and we are different. Yeah. But we've learned a lot, I think, Becky, and Rich would back me up on this. Because we're older white males, our group really needs to get this. I think that, you know, we want very much to change the cortisol levels of people who don't want to include because it's better for the planet, it's better for our country, it's better for our businesses when we learn, you know, that we have to share the planet. And um, I, I think that Rich and I, as older white men, have been on a journey of learning inclusion and we're different even though we're identical twins. That's really helpful. So, Ralph, can we go to the final slide? I have a few calls to action for those of you who have been on today's event. We right. want to make sure we get to these before our hour together is up. Um, so there are a few possible next steps for you. Um, RDR Group does this amazing thing of offering free diversity pilot sessions for organizations. And if you are curious about that, Ralph will be sending out a follow-up email and you can interact with Ralph, schedule time to talk, to figure out if a free pilot session is right for your organization. You can also do any uh, consultation or call with Ralph if you'd like to talk more about these topics. We would invite you to connect via, uh, connect on LinkedIn with Ralph or me or Rich um, by searching for us. Um, we can put those LinkedIn links for Ralph and Rich in our follow-up email. And then also RDR Group has a page on LinkedIn and every week we're sharing um, inspiring and helpful um, content that will help you in your work environments. So we encourage you, once you connect on LinkedIn, you're gonna find out that Ralph and Rich are putting out uh, bi-monthly articles, each of them uh, posting once a month with some very helpful workplace content. Uh, the other thing that we would invite you to do, and we'll provide the link for this, I don't know, Kelly, if you can grab it and put it in the chat, um, but we do have a webinar coming up in November with Rich Brandt who was on for a moment today um, and it sounds like some of you are glad to see him and that's going to be November 21st at 1 p.m. Eastern on Zoom on the topic of resilience and how to stay resilient in the midst of workplace chaos. So that's going to be an incredibly uh, helpful topic and we hope that you'll sign up to join us for that webinar as well. Uh, Ralph and Rich, thanks for this time in this day I'm inspired and you know have some action items to take and I'm sure all of you who have been a part of today's event have some as well so thanks and we'll see you all next time thanks Becky thanks everybody take care